Let us talk about various cloud computing models we have. For the sake of explanation, let us assume that I'm running a startup company and I have a bunch of developers who are building an application. In order to host that application, I would obviously need infrastructure. Let us assume for the time being that I'm preferring to have an on-premise infrastructure. So here are all the steps that I'm going to follow to have the infrastructure in place. First of all, I'm going to procure the required servers. And by servers, I would mean compute power like processor memory and storage like storage area network, SSD, etc. depending on your needs. Once I have the servers, I can install operating system. But what I'm going to do rather is I'm going to install a virtualization software. Now, why is this needed? Let us assume that your server is having 12 GB of RAM. If I install operating system directly on server, then I can only have one server that utilizes the entire 12 GB of RAM. However, if I install virtualization technology, I can actually create multiple virtual servers, but they also split the resources like you're seeing. So once I have the virtualization technology or software, I would then install the operating system like Windows, Linux or anything of your choice. Now I cannot just host my application right away on the operating system. I would need runtime and middleware and that's where application server, web server, Tomcat, Docker, etc. would come into picture depending on the application that you're hosting. If you're not familiar with any of these, then just think of this layer as something that glues both operating system and your application. It's sort of like a middleman between OS and your application. Once I have the runtime and middleware, I can then host or deploy my application along with its data. And this is where I'm going to copy or deploy the artifacts, dependencies, packed files, data, etc. For example, if you're hosting a WordPress website, then in addition to copying all the packages, themes, etc., you also need to copy the data that your application uses. But what's the point of having a server with your application hosted when it cannot communicate with the outside world? That's where networking would come into picture. And here we have routers, switches, local area network, virtual private network, internet connectivity, etc. Essentially, you're going to do all the networking so that your server can communicate with the outside world and outside world can actually send requests to your server. So this is the case with on-premise infrastructure. I can categorize servers or the compute power networking virtualization as the infrastructure layer. The operating system, runtime and middleware we can categorize them as platform layer. And then finally we have the application or from the perspective of end user, it's a software layer. If we have third party company that provides infrastructure, then we can say that they're providing infrastructure as a service or simply IaaS. And if there's a company who provides both infrastructure as well as platform, then we call it platform as a service or pass. And you guessed it, if a company provides everything, including application and data, then they're essentially providing software as a service or SaaS. Now, where does cloud service providers like AWS, Azure, GSE would fit in here? Well, they actually provide combination of all these services. Next, we're going to take a look at characteristics of each one of these along with examples. That way you'll have a better picture. If I were to layer all the cloud computing models in the form of a pyramid, then as we go up the pyramid, we're going to see increase in ease of use, but decrease in flexibility. That means we'll have lesser control on the infrastructure and the platform. And vice versa, as we go down the pyramid, you're going to see decrease in ease of use, but increase in flexibility. The typical users of each layer would be like so. For SaaS, it's going to be the end user who would use their application typically over a browser. And then we have PaaS, whose typical user would be developers who are not bothered about creation of infrastructure or the platform, but more focused on developing the application and deploying it. And for IaaS, it's going to be network architects who are familiar with creating infrastructure solutions. Now let's take a look at characteristics of each one of these. In SaaS, the end user would just use the application that is managed by the service provider. 
Typically, they won't interact with the application over the browser. The end user doesn't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure and how it is managed or maintained. You do not have any kind of control over the application platform or the infrastructure. It is all managed by the service provider. The security of your personal data is at the mercy of the vendor. Gmail and Dropbox are a couple of examples of SaaS. In these two applications, you just use them as an end user and you have least control on how they are managed. And then we have PaaS, which is Platform as a Service. It provides both infrastructure and a platform to deploy the application. It allows the developers to stay focused on building the software rather than setting up the infrastructure. Since you are least bothered about the underlying infrastructure, it's relatively quicker to deploy your application or migrate your application from the on-premise infrastructure. It increases time to market. Because of the fact that you don't have to spend time in creation of the infrastructure and the software stack, your company might get more time to market your service or the product. It is best suited for startups who cannot afford to have an on-premise infrastructure and they want to scale fast without the need to manage the underlying infrastructure. Couple of examples of PaaS would be Elastic Beanstack and Heroku. Essentially, they both offer you ready-to-use environment that allows you to deploy your application fast. You do not have to spend time creating the instances, capacity provisioning, allocating the resources, load balancing, scaling, or installing the software stack. You can even configure auto-updation, which means the entire software stack would be updated automatically. If you were to have a chat conversation with PaaS, this is how it might go. It's going to ask you what application do you want to deploy. And then you're going to reply back saying, I want to deploy PHP application. It would then reply back saying, okay, here is the platform. I'll take care of the resource provisioning and scaling. You just stay focused on your app. Let's now talk about infrastructure as a service or IaaS. In this case, the infrastructure is managed by the service provider as opposed to on-premise. In other words, it's pretty much similar to having an on-premise infrastructure except infrastructure is managed by somebody else and they're going to provide you that as a service. It gives you flexibility to create and manage your own infrastructure or customize the software stack. There is a need to hire someone to manage the infrastructure. Migration requires expertise and might be a bit time consuming. Amazon EC2 or Elastic Compute Cloud and DistroLotion are a couple of examples of IAS model. But essentially with these services, you get to create several instances, choose how much memory storage you need, etc. If you were to have chat conversation with IaaS, this is how it might go. It's going to ask you what do you need to deploy your solution or the application. And then you might reply back saying, I want 100 instances of 2 GB memory each and about 10 TB of storage. It's going to respond back saying, okay, here you go. Is there anything else I can assist you with? Hope it makes sense. If you like this video, you should also check out my other video which is on the same topic. Link to that video is in the description below. Make sure you watch it. I've also kept some useful resources on this topic. Again, you're going to find them all in the description below. But before you leave, do like and subscribe. The current subscriber count of this channel is embarrassingly low. And this channel is really struggling to take off despite putting a lot of effort to create good content. It only takes a couple of seconds for you to like and subscribe. I don't really expect you to share this video because I understand it's a difficult task to do. But if you do it as well, it helps this channel and keeps us motivated to bring you more quality content like this. I'll see you in my next video. Have a great day ahead.